The uh, demonstration today is hypersizer on a wing box. Um, by way of introduction, it's uh, similar to a 737. A fine element model um, is used for the uh, load calculation. It's imported into the hypersizer software. As shown here, um, the underside of the lower skin um, with the access panels, um, how it would actually uh, be used as the structural backbone for uh, the commercial wing. Here is a view of the wing uh, prototype of it, composite, uh, in, a, in a tooling uh, jig. And here is the upper skin cover, as you see it being uh, manufactured with some modern uh, technology here. Now, part of the uh, demonstration's purpose is to uh, show how the optimization not only includes the weight savings uh, from uh, getting um, using the best use of strength and stability, but also producibility is, is the uh, uh, highlight, really, of this demonstration to show how the composite laminate um, is optimized to be uh, most producible. Here we're looking at a chart to indicate uh, it's an actual uh, hypersizer output that shows the, uh, the plies as they go, go across the wing panel. Uh, this is the uh, content of today's demonstration. Uh, also included is the, uh, the laminate, or what we refer to as hyperlaminates, for the stiffener. Again, um, the optimization being uh, very practical in that it comes up with uh, producible parts. Um, as we do the optimization for strength and stability, we also include fabrication checks um, for like the ability to come back later and repair uh, your part if it had been damaged. This image shows the uh, fine element model um, from the center wing box to the tip. And here's the Bay 7 um, cross-sectional view here. This particular model is what we refer to as a discrete stiffen model. Technique 3, where the stiffeners are modeled with uh, individual shell and bar elements. Today's uh, demonstration is going to use a smeared model like this, uh, where we are, uh, will have complete control over the placement. Uh, and the spacing of those stiffeners and the size of the stiffeners, actually the shape of the stiffener as well. There really is no loss of accuracy uh, in uh, the model by smearing the stiffener to the skin um, as used with hypersizer. We start the process by creating a project in an open database. We'll give the project the name Wingbox which will then pull up the setup form. Um, from here, you can choose the FEA solver. Uh, we support ANSYS, Abacus, uh, the different flavors of Nastran. Today, we will choose MSC Nastran. Uh, the red font indicates this particular file name is not um, available. Um, obviously, it's looking for a wing box model. Uh, which doesn't exist. So what we'll do is actually go to the server and um, find an existing model that does exist. And when we do that, um, you'll see this a BDF, and next to it is a, an OP2 file, um, which is a binary uh, representation of the computed FEA solver forces. Uh, and um, the other option would have been an F06 file, which is an ASCII representation of the same data. Uh, the next step would be to save and then import the model. At the bottom, you can see a status bar. Um, it's completed the import. There were four unique load sets identified in the Nastran case control, 100, 200, 300, and 400. Um, here you can specify different limit and ultimate load factors if you so desired, uh, whereas we could come in here and put in an ultimate load factor of 1.5 uh, like this and hit save. Uh, on the load cases tab, you can identify which of those load sets you want to actually use in this um, particular session of your analysis or optimization. Uh, we can go ahead and hit save there. 
The next step would be to pull up the sizing form and to run a batch setup file. And it's running down here. After it runs uh, successfully, we will then pull up the graphics. Um, what we'll have to do is uh, come over here and size the graphics to fit in the same window space as the other form. This will probably do fine. And I can rotate that around. Um, you can see the underside where the access panels are, lower skin. Today we will uh, focus on the upper skin panels here. And there has been an assembly identified. Uh, assembly on full model may give you a better view of what that is that we're looking at. And um, each color being um, a different sizing zone representing the bay between the ribs of the wing box. Um, it is our goal today to optimize uh, the stiffener spacing, the stiffener heights, um, all of the cross-sectional variables of this panel segment, as well as the composite laminate for the skin and the hyperlaminate for the stiffener. Um, at this point, we can now actually do the optimization of that. So we can do the optimization. We click that icon there, and it does run that fast. Uh, in about one second. The information shown in the diagnostic window is the total weight, 588 pounds, 217 square feet, and component 104, 105, 106, 107, um, and so forth um, being shown with their unit weights and their um, ply counts in the different directions. So for the scan laminate, we're looking at 60 plies in the zero axis, 29 plies in the 45, and 11 plies in the 90 degree direction of that laminate for a total laminate thickness of 0.2475. Uh, likewise, the flange, the web, the cap, all the ply counts are given for those uh, um, panel objects as well. And there will be another way to see data. Uh, of course, the first way would be to actually uh, look at margins of safety here. And uh, we've got too many significant figures. And uh, you could look at it this way, or we have a unique uh, margin of safety um, um, dedicated color scale here. So anything that's yellow is uh, from a 0 to 0 0.02 margin of safety, and anything in the light green color from 0 0.02 to 0 0.1. So we have no negative margins and no margins greater than 0.1. Another piece of information we can see would be the optimum weight of the, the panels. And so the scale here ranges from a 0.369 pounds per square foot um, and as we move the cursor down, uh, you can see the components are getting lighter as we would expect as we go to or toward the root, I mean, excuse me, toward the tip. Uh, another interesting piece of information is the controlling failure mode. So those highlighted in green are controlled by strength, uh, crippling, local buckling, and then panel buckling. Uh, let's change the view to just the um, assembly here. And um, there's other data that can also be plotted on the finite element model. At this point, I'm going to plot some of the cross-sectional dimensions. I may start with the top face thickness first. And as you can see here in the red is the uh, laminate thickness close to quarter inch and as I move down on my scale, you can see the values update on the image until uh, we get to a, a thinner laminate on the tip. Another data quantity of interest would be the stiffener spacing. And let me move this up here. And using the same color scale, I can see now um, part of the wing is about 10 inches um, optimum in spacing. And as we go toward the, the tip of the wing, we can see the spacing uh, of the stiffeners want to be closer together. 
Now, at this point, may, we may wonder um, how the software has been able to optimize these panels. Let me first uh, show the fact that, uh, indeed, we are uh, extracting the finite element uh, data from the solver. And here you're looking at the magnitude of the running load in ax, membrane axial load. Uh, that would be in the direction of what we call the material axis. So you can see here in the element um, a arrow, an orange arrow representing the material axis, which would be the stiffener direction and also the zero fiber direction of a composite. Uh, I'll turn that off. Um, another way to look at this data is to say assembly on full model or where we can actually uh, mirror uh, the model and you can actually see it in this fashion here. Um, and so um, it is a, a wing box skin cover that we are optimizing and it is uh, this surface area of that wing box. Um, another thing you may uh, in the analysis uh, be aware is that for panel buckling we would have to know what the panel buckling span lengths are and as I come over here, I turn off the do not mirror, um, and then I can kind of zoom in here, and I can actually make a transparent view, makes it maybe a slightly uh, better to see the red marker, which identifies the distance from spar to spar in the cordwise, and from rib to rib in the spanwise direction. And we can see that the markers uh, are basically automatically calculated during model import, uh, for each of the panel bays. Now let's go ahead and take off the marker and let's uh, go back in the normal view here. And before I completely uh, remove this, uh, do um <coughs> uh, take note that the, the highest, the highest uh, value for compression uh, running load in the wing is in this area right here and you'll notice that in the unit weight calculation and then the uh, number of plies required uh, for that part of the laminate. Um, and then we'll, let me at this point uh, take this away and what we're looking at now would be the, uh, the more traditional um, input uh, for those that are been using hypersizer for a while would uh, be familiar with this and this is the variables tab where uh, as you click on the different labels, you can see like the height uh, or the stiffener spacing or the flange width. Uh, for variables that do um, have an associated material involved, you would see um, a list of candidate laminates down here. Uh, and likewise, for the stiffener, you'll see these laminates. Let me also bring out to your attention, um, if I were to uh, click one of these guys here, um, this is what we call a stiffener hyperlaminate and the L2, L3, and L4 uh, basically refer to uh, the layer where um, the ply is continuous or the ply drops off. There will be more discussed about this in a later video. Um, going back to the skin laminate, um, now what I will do is uh, optimize all of the panel bays of this assembly. Uh, now the optimization is complete. It took about 45 seconds. This is what we refer to as direct optimization. And it's in contrast to the optimization you saw earlier on the graphics, um, and that is what we refer to as auto-tuning optimization. It took probably about one second uh, to optimize those skin panels with that newer technology. Now that the uh, optimization for the assembly um, has been accomplished for the skin, what I'll do next is uh, producibility trades. And I will go now directly to laminate sequencing. Let's go ahead, uh, we can make this uh, full screen. Um, make that a little bit uh, smaller. And uh, what I'll do is hit optimize. Of course, when I do this, um, it's going to give me a message saying that my plot drops have not yet been created. Um, I will now uh, do that. So I'll pull up the plot drop feature, say generate. And what the, the plot drops purpose is, is to identify uh, the 
um, basically the neighbors of each of the different skins to know um, when a possible um, drop in a ply will occur. It will happen here at these transitions that have uh, been established by the fine element model during import uh, for each of these separate components. The, the components um, can be identified in the legend on the right, or another manner of doing that would be to uh, focus in on just the assembly itself. Um, the reason I'm uh, showing this is so that uh, later these uh, integer values uh, basically are the structural components and they will appear um, in the form that you'll see next. So if I take this away and now I hit optimize, um, <coughs> it is going to do a, a full sequencing of all the laminates of that uh, skin and um, it takes uh, uh, not that long. Um, it will be finished probably in about another five or ten seconds. And after it passes the uh, first um, loop through, it, it speeds up dramatically. And here are the, the numbers I was referring to earlier. Um, and the way this works is if I minimize this, uh, kind of helps maybe to see uh, that near the tip of the wing at component 123 is a 7-ply laminate. Next to it is a 10-ply laminate, a 14-ply laminate and 15 ply laminate and so forth. The, uh, the, uh, the, the use of the uh, X means it's a full assembly ply. If I right click here, these are all the zero degree plies, uh, 45 degree plies. Um, and you can sort these um, uh, any number of ways to see um, the data in your, in your uh, preference, either global ply ID on the top or global ply ID on the bottom. Let me also mention, though, um, it may not be uh, obvious to start with here, but each one of these components have a symmetric and balanced layup. Um, so if you were to go, um, certainly if you look at the thinner laminate, you can see here that global ply 1 is a 90, and the, the OML is a, is a 90, and then 45, minus 45, then a 0. Uh, if you look at the next one, um, global ply 1 is a 90, 2 is a 45, and so forth. And the pattern um, follows that. So you can see this is the same as that, and this is symmetric, and the whole stack up is symmetric. We can also show this type of information in the graphics. Um, there are a number of different ways of doing that. Um, if I turn on the legend, uh, global ply 1 looks like this. And as I go down, you can see the actual coverage of each one of those ply values. Um, another way to see this same data um, would be to use uh, this approach where you uh, can actually see the process used to build up that laminate. Now, uh, keep in mind this is the, the, uh, the tool side, uh, so what we want to do is actually show it and the way um, it would actually be uh, built. And so it's more like this here, where um, the, the thicker laminates, as you can imagine, would be uh, right there where the higher, highest load was. Uh, we saw from the uh, FEA extracted forces. So this is a nice little tool to actually be able to demonstrate that you do have indeed a, a, a design that's producible. And the global plaza are identified, apply coverage. Um, this is another way of seeing that same data where you kind of expand it out this way and you can see how it's actually laid up. Uh, again, maybe we would want to go over here and um, look at it, maybe at a, at a wider spacing, and you can see it this way. So um, going back to this view here, uh, those with a sharp eye uh, will see that um, though it's a producible part, probably not uh, as desirable as we, as we may want because 
the um, ply, we don't have a full coverage on the um, IML, uh, nor nor do we have a full coverage on the uh, OML as as well, and um, that can be seen as well when we go back to this view here. Uh, you can see that um, again the uh, Nani goes. Uh, pretty far on the wing skin cover but it doesn't go all the way to the last three components and then we have this material here um, so 121 doesn't have the, the 90 degree ply a again our goal at this time was to minimize weight um, later um, I will we'll, uh, demonstrate how we can use the slider bar to make the uh, part more manufacturable uh, but what will happen is the weight will go up from the minimum weight but the number of individual drops and adds will drop, uh, be reduced, and the number of global plies reduced, the number of ply cuts reduced, and uh, the max number of plies not interleaved will also be reduced. For now, let's go ahead and say apply this to the assembly uh, to be able to move on to the last step, which we call um, finalize um, or touch up um, the actual laminate. And so after we do this, uh, we will then reanalyze. And it's getting the material data. It's running right now. And you can see on the status bar, uh, there are 20 components. It's currently on component 8. Um, and it's uh, optimizing now the, the uh, other remaining free cross-sectional dimensions and stiffener laminates while freezing uh, essent essentially the, uh, the laminate. And so now you can see this information uh, in a more uh, classical way where the actual uh, ply 90 or 45 or 0 is shown um, in the table. And um, that's the hypersessor default color scheme, the fibrosim default, and Katia's uh, default color scheme for seeing this kind of information. Uh, the problem is it's just hard to, uh, to see all of this at one time. Um, so many uh, global plies. Okay, so what we want to do next is to export this information to, say, CATIA and to a spreadsheet. And we would like to be able to uh, have CATIA be able to uh, do something where they um, um, edit it, um, touch it up, and then you want to basically um, have the ability to then um, import that back into HyperSet. So let's go ahead and uh, go back to the top here. And uh, uh, we exported the CATIA. And it's, there it is here. Let me bring it to the next screen. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do here is to, to see that um, this is the 90450, 90450. So it is the same data um, as you see here on the screen, exported to the spreadsheet. Um, and let's just go ahead and, and um, add in um, some information here to see how this would work. So let's put in a minus 45 here. Um, in fact, we can put that there, that here. I don't, um, minus 45 there. And uh, let's go ahead and just delete this, delete that, delete this, and delete that. And let's just say uh, save. And then after it's saved, um, I will come back over here and say import and files CATIA open. And it's thinking, it's uh, taking all the old data and refreshing it with a new spreadsheet added to data. And now it's just completed. And you can see here the drop, the drop, the drop, the drop, and then the add and the add. These are the edits we made in the spreadsheet.